What up, what up, what up, what up? It's me, L Teddy 27. Good night, dude. Right about the hood. Oh, dear God. I'm already eating the drink. Look at damn mess. It's just a damn mess. Please no. And yes, me, no. What up, 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 what's good, people? What is up? What's up? What's up? What's up? It is me, L Teddy 27, and I'm back for another review. This is going to be our review for Queen Sugar. It is season five. This is episode four. It is entitled, uh, I don't know. It's somewhere around it. Why I keep forgetting to write down the titles? I don't know. It'll be somewhere on screen. Anyway, let's get right down to it. Now, let me be honest. I, the episode was kind of slow for me up until like the last 10 minutes. Excuse me. The only big scene for me was the one in the middle with Micah and Charlie, but we'll get there. But it was kind of slow for me in the beginning. It didn't, um, there wasn't a whole, I'm not going to say there wasn't a lot there because you have to have these episodes where you continue to build on the um, rising action and you continue to connect dots within the storyline. So, and the plot line, but let's, let's get there. Let's get down to the meat and potatoes. All right. So we got Ralph Angel. We start off. He and Darla are at home and Darla has started this thing where she's making upholstery and so forth. Because if you remember last episode, when Ralph Angel was leaving to go to work, she was at the sewing machine. She was sewing and stuff like that. And, he, and she says to him, oh, I'm making something. Don't worry. It's going to be great and so forth. Then, um, you know, she has his, you know, clothes out back on the clothesline and, you know, everything. She's turned into a whole housewife. And I immediately wrote down, I wonder if she's going to be OK with just being a simple housewife, because that just doesn't seem like her thing. Like, you don't go from being a whore to just being a housewife like that. Literally, I'm just saying. Anyway, on his way out, um, Blue is outside and um, he's out there with Blue and Blue is um, telling him how Darla um, said make sure, you know, to leave his clothes outside so that, um, you know, because he works around elderly people to protect, protect them from any chances of COVID, the virus and so forth. And so then Darla came out or whatever, but Blue done turned into this whole ass doctor slash scientist where he just ran, rambles off like all of the information you need to know about body temperature and what is and is not acceptable. And, you know, all of those things in terms of um, the human body and what's a normal body temperature. And it was so cute. It was so great. Um, and if you remember back in episode one, when Ralph Angel was reading the book about having a gifted child and I love seeing this on screen this black boy who is gifted and is young and is and is able to express himself fully i've always talked about the beauty in how ralph angel in his parenting he always let blue just be authentically him when, back when he had the doll if you remember and everything about him he just let him explore everything about his own um psyche his own you know head space and who he is as an individual while still um, nurturing him and while still guiding him along in the child rearing process. So I just love that um, they are letting him truly sit there and just be a gifted little boy. And they sit there and they encourage him and they, they don't do like you see some parents where they act disinterested or they try to make it as if it's not a big deal. And they sit there and they're engaged and they're here for it. And I was here for it. I loved seeing this interaction. This was a beautiful interaction for me. Well um, written. The cinematography here was great. The colors was great. Um, I even sometimes look at some of the different textures and different things, um, the contrasting textures and colors and things with the different characters and how that may speak to that character's um, um, character traits and personalities and things like that. So I, all of that was a great scene there. We then got Nova and White Boy Cop at home. So White Boy Cop done made breakfast and Nova's like, now wait a minute. Hold on. You don't make breakfast. Mm, what you about to ask me? <laughs> and he is about to ask her something. I don't have no snacks, but I do have something to drink. Power aid water. Power water. Very chilly. Very good. Anyway, um, he tells her, listen, his oldest daughter, I don't know if his oldest daughter, but one of his older daughters who's in college, she, the college is basically shut down. She has to go home and quarantine at home, but she doesn't want to go home to her mom. She wants to stay with her dad which means she has to stay with her dad and Nova. And so he asks Nova about this and Nova is 
of course, apprehensive. Nova feels some kind of way after the whole interaction with his ex-wife and with the son who she met. And she is like, listen, I'm not really here for this, but um, I'm not going to tell you, you can't see your child. And she's very uncomfortable with this idea. But like anybody who decides to be with somebody does, if you want to be with them, you have to embrace the fact. If they have children, you got to embrace their children and you have to come to grips with that. So um, he white boy cop tries to reassure her that, no, she's not like her mom. She isn't a horrible person. She isn't that bad. It's not going to be that um, um, what you experienced with my ex-wife. And Nova, Nova was like, well, the bond between a mother and a daughter is very strong. The problem with that is, while that may be true in cases, Nova, that was your experience. And that's not always the experience for mothers and daughters. Um, I know many daughters who don't have that kind of relationship with their mom. Um, they have them more close to their father. Um, so it, she's um, projecting her experience with her mom on what um, white boy cop's daughter probably has with her own mom. But he tries to reassure her and so forth. So then we see Charlie and Micah at home. And Charlie is, you know, she's in the kitchen. She's making, you know, vittles and salads and snacks and, you know, playing music and just trying to make being at home quarantined a comfortable experience for her and Micah. Um, Micah, you know, at first comes in and he, you know, says, I uh, want me to help you out. And he's helping her. Then he gets a call from the, the um, new girl. And so um, once he gets this call from a new chick, he stops helping her. He was supposed to be helping Charlie, but new chick got all his attention, literally. And, um, I don't, I really want them to at least show us new chick. I just want to see it, see her with my eyes. I have a visual in my head and I've always pictured new chick being a white chick. Always, always. When he said scissor, I pictured a white chick that liked black guys. You know, you know the ones I'm talking about. You know the white chicks who only dates black guys and then wants to try to misappropriate black culture and act like they're, you know, you know, you you know those stereotypical, you know, white girls. Anyway, that's what I pictured him dating. Anyway, Charlie, um, um, you see Charlie's a little not comfortable with that, but she lets it go. <coughs> Aunt Bai is then on the phone with Hollywood. Hollywood is in Baton Rouge. Hollywood is um there at the hospital, outside of the hospital, because they won't let him go in to see his mom. And that was the case with most people with COVID-19. They would not, people were in the hospital literally dying alone because they would not let family members go and see the person. They would not. And I, I remember that I, I have many um, friends of my aunts and relatives who have passed away. And just the, the, the horrible feeling of emptiness and loneliness when you think of the notion of somebody dying and wanting your last moments to perhaps be that of you being able to see touch hear, and you know those last couple breaths you take or the last thing you see being your loved ones or the last thing you want to experience is have being able to have the loved one tell you that they love you and you know this that, and the third and being robbed of that you know just to wrap your hands around that is 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 just a horrific notion just completely horrific and so you see all of that and the actor that plays that I can't remember his name who plays Hollywood did a phenomenal acting job this episode. I mean, it wasn't just his facial expressions that did it, his body language. I, I paid attention more so to his body language than necessarily his facial expression and his body language spoke volumes. It was little nuances of how he would slump his shoulders sometimes or how he would do the thing where, where he just felt like defeated and would just lean against the wall and, and have to use his foot to hold him up or something like that against the wall. Like little nuances where you knew that's something where the actor had to just embody all of this and just take it all in and experience this. Um, and I can't say that maybe he did not go through that himself personally. I don't know if he did or did not, but whatever he channeled to embody this role during this episode, Great job. Great job. Um, but he he talked about literally being in the parking lot, staying there for four days straight in the parking lot 
and he didn't know which room his mom was in, so he fixated himself on one window that he just imagined his mom was in that room and would stare at that one window for four days. And I mean, <laughs> what do you say to that? What do you say to that? Like, it, it, it comes off sad. Um, you know, most people, when they hear that, they approach it as, oh my God, that's sad. For me, I approach it as, wow, that's some good writing. I just, that's where I, where I went with that is, that's some good writing right there. Like, great, great writing. Just bringing everybody in back to that moment. All of the feelings, all of the emotions, even if you heard a story and did not um, necessarily ex experience it, you could have sympathy. But if you could experience the empathy, because maybe you went through it, a whole different... It pro it drug you right into him and, and it just pulled on the heartstrings. I, I loved it. The, the writing here with um, Hollywood was great. We then see Nova and White Boy Cop at home. His daughter comes. Her name is Courtney. Blonde haired chick, you know, real pale and white and stuff like that. Anyway, um, let me tell you something. I caught it. I don't know if y'all caught it. Now, she wasn't, she was, Nova was welcoming to her. She was welcoming to Nova. But before that first handshake hug thing, when Nova first addressed her, her facial expression was like, almost like taken aback, like, I, it, it was not a favorable facial expression at first. And it was for a split second, too. It was like split second, like first reaction, like, and then it was like, oh, let me smile and embrace you and shake your hand. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking too far into it. But y'all go back and look and tell me what y'all saw. And then she, because um, she had did her homework on Nova. And she said, oh, I heard all about you and your true papers and this, that, and the third. So obviously she's done her homework on Nova. I don't know that Nova has done her homework on, on this, um, on her. So that whole interaction was okay. It went well, but we still got several episodes to go. We didn't see Aunt Vi. She's calling Mr. Prosper. And, you know, Mr. Pro Mr. Prosper is still off-putting. He's still being aloof. He's still, we find out he ain't been out the house in how many months now? Ain't been out the house. Refuses to come out the house. And she talks with him and finally coaxes him to come out of the house and invites him over to her house by saying that she would cook him a nice home-cooked meal. And he says, okay, I'll come over. We then back at Charlie's house and um, Charlie talks to Micah about what she experienced being um, a pregnant college student, becoming pregnant with him in college and having him while she was in college and being so young and having to get it together and so forth. And it was a very intimate conversation, one that you could tell. I was surprised that she had never had this conversation with him. And I it just I don't I just felt like and maybe and, and, and I'm neglecting the fact that, you know, before the start of this series, if you the character technically had a lot going on with being an agent for um Davis and so forth. I don't know if she was an agent for other um basketball players. I don't remember. I shouldn't say I don't know, I should say I don't remember. But she had a lot going on. And so I would suspect that with a lot going on, maybe there wasn't this closeness or maybe because of Micah's age, she didn't feel comfortable having a conversation. But I find it interesting that it's not until he gets into college that she has this conversation with him about her experience um, as a college student with um, him as a baby and her being pregnant and having him. Anyway, Back down to um the old people home where Ralph Angel works at. He's there. And he's buffing the floors and waxing the floors or whatever. So he runs up on this older black man named Reggie who's in his room shadow boxing and so forth. And um they have a conversation. He stops and has a conversation with him. And the one thing I, I said over and over and over and I'm going to say it again. I always love the interactions on this show between black men, especially how they always give you these generational conversations between black men and a lot of times they just get it right and I wonder who on the writing um, team is responsible for these um, interactions because you see it over and over and over every season we I mean going all the way back to when the father was still alive episode one and so I would love to be in that writer's room when they're, you know, writing these scenes between the black men because they always seem to get it right. And they did it again this time. And you have this older man named Reggie who's talking about um, 
you know, finding true love and so forth. He's been married to his wife for 56 years. And we learned that his wife is at the facility as well, but his wife is in another part um, where they specialize because his wife has dementia and the other section or part of the um, facility, they have people that specialize in dementia and can give her all of the care that she needs. So his wife is in another um, part of the facility. But he talks all about how she's his soulmate. And, and, and you could see the wheels churning around Angel's head that, oh, this is what I want with Darla. So, Ralph Angel then goes home. Darla is complaining. I told y'all Darla wasn't going to like being a housewife. She's complaining because she doesn't like being a housewife. She don't like being stuck in the house. She's tired of always having to be there to listen. I told y'all, see, gifted children are very, they're not necessarily bad in the um, traditional sense. They're what my grandmother would call busy. My grandmother was like, no, nah, they're not bad. They're just busy. Meaning the, 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 the mind of the gifted child is always moving, always churning, always just looking for an opportunity to just spit out something that just came across their mind. They just want to get it out. They got so many thoughts going at so many, going at such a rapid pace that they just want to get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. And they want somebody who's going to sit there and authentically listen, engage them and want to hear what they have to say. If you are not someone who can handle it, it gets daunting. It gets aggravating, frustrating, and you get really worn thin with it really quickly. And that's where Darla is. Darla's like, listen, I got to sit here with your child. I got to deal with the house stuff. I don't feel useful. I want to go back to work. I need to get back to work. And she has cabin fever and so forth. Ra then does what he's supposed to do. He's a man. He comforts his wife. He tells her, come in, get in position. And he comforts her by, you know, picking her up and carefully propping her as he picks her up right down on his meat to feel the thing that should give her a little gumption and something to keep it going and keep moving. Let her feel it and say, girl, you got this. We got this. We all right. You know, you give her a good feel of the meat and them arms wrapped around you. It'll make you rethink some things, you know? So that's what we got going on. Um... We then have Nova, White Boy Cop, and Courtney. They're at the table. They play cards. I think they were playing poker. I think they were playing poker. But there was this whole conversation um, where he accused her of being aggressive. And Courtney went off on this whole rant about him being misogynistic and chauvinistic and all of the different things that she had clearly been learning in school that um, he was doing and portraying and projecting. And Nova is sitting there like... And so white boy cop looks to Nova for help. And she was like, mm, I ain't nothing I can do for you because she preach your backs right now. And so you saw this little connection between Nova and Courtney. I don't know how long that's going to last. I told y'all, I don't know. We still too early in this, but they seem to have a little connection or whatever. Um, um, I finally um, gets Mr. Prosper over the house. So she bringing Mr. Prosper in. She had called um, um, Hollywood and already asked Hollywood if Mr. Prosper could just stay at their house, so he just wasn't home alone anymore. And um, Hollywood said, yeah, and they, she had a room set up for him and so forth. While, and so her and Mr. Prosper are there. She's like, oh, let me fix you a plate, this, that, and the third. And they're talking, Hollywood calls. And Hollywood says, they're taking her off the ventilator, his mom. And um, you could tell he's on the brink. He's teetering on the brink of complete meltdown, thermal nuclear meltdown do you hear me just a complete breakdown he's on a brink and she gives him you know some comforting words um and praise but let's be clear the loss of a parent there's no comfort in that there are no words that someone can tell you that gives you comfort and solace there are none you there's nothing mm -mm. people can say all the good words oh they're god's hands. i don't want them to be in god's hands right now you know everything somebody says to you is just like patronizing and you just don't want you don't want to hear it you don't want to hear anything nice you don't want to hear nothing comforts you and i think i think especially with by not being there those words the prayer and everything it comes off hollow because you, you your whole being is you know engulfed in you know at that point bereavement grief yeah even though the mom wasn't dead yet, I mean, you are there. You are your body, your mind, your soul is starting to grapple with and entertain that this is about to happen. <sighs> anyway, Charlie is at home with Micah. Micah get his phone is on the um on the little um 
on the table in the, in the um, living room, coffee table. And he gets a text message or a voice message in the text or something like that. And, it's, and the notification sound went off. So Charlie t- called him and said, Michael, your phone. She picks up the phone to go hand it to him and the phone turns on and the um, the message plays. And it's the new chick. And she's at a party. You hear all of the music and all of the people in the background. And Charlie immediately jumps to every conclusion in the world. So Michael comes and sees her listening to the message. And he was like, what are you doing? And she was like, I, it just came on. I was trying to hand it to you. But then she goes off. He was upset because he thought she was violating his privacy. She then um, follows that up by going off because she's um, assuming that he's about to go to this party and not quarantine like he should and perhaps bring COVID home to her because they over here having a whole COVID con at this party and she don't want him to go. So she starts going off. So I talking about how she had a problem with um, this girl and how could he put the both of them in danger for, you know, for her, da, 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 for, and then she blurts out for sex, and Michael looks, and then she doubles down on the, you're doing this just for sex, and says, like father, like son, which I think collectively, we all who were watching at that time did a <gasps> guess, because we were like, now you knew how Michael feels about his father cheating on his mom, and how Michael feels about that whole situation, and I was like, ooh, that's wrong. That's not good. And um, yeah, it kind of went to commercial from there. Because he storms out in anger. He storms out of the house in anger. Um, I, I, I probably would have too. I mean, she knew she had messed up. She knew. There was no go- going back from that. It was like, yeah, that was bad. That was pretty bad. Nova and Courtney um, <clears throat> are at the house. White boy cop is in the other room washing dishes or doing something. And her... Nova and Courtney are just talking and, you know, connecting a little more and just talking. And so the Courtney chick reassures Nova, listen, I'm not my mom. I'm not like my mom. I don't have the same ideologies as my mom. And um, she says, I see how my dad looks at you. I see you all's interaction and I see that he loves you. And so she reassures Nova that, listen, I'm not here to antagonize you. I'm here for, you know, I'm here for good stuff. I'm here to, you know, make it easier. Anyway, we see Aunt Vi. She um is still spoiling Mr. Prosper. And as she's spoiling Mr. Prosper, Hollywood calls and tells her that his mom died. And I told y'all last episode we weren't gonna be well with his mom dying. But his mom died prosper and no, I'm sorry. Hollywood didn't call. Um Hollywood had called earlier before we saw the scene. And so Prosper noticed that vibe was, you know, a little melancholy. She wasn't her normal bubbly self. And she just told him I talked to Hollywood earlier that his mom passed. Um, And, you know, he's having a hard time with that. And she was kind of beating herself up a little because she was like, I don't, I should have been there, you know? And and you you go through that. And I, I, I felt her on that. She wanted to be there. And she was kind of beating herself up a little bit about it. Prosper goes on to say, you know, we go through, we've lived, my generation and so forth, we've lived through all of these things, all of these horrific experiences as a people. And now only to have this pandemic picking us off one by one, it's just like, almost saying it's just way too much to bear, way too much to bear. And then they kind of have this moment where Vi kind of reassures him that, listen, we're going to get through this. We got this. We don't have a choice. We got to get through this. And, you know, they hold hands and stuff like that. Um, in the sign of, you know, just just wanting to reassure him that listen, we 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 we're gonna get through this. We got to. Ralph Angel is at the nursing home again, and he talks to the guy Reggie, and we find out that it's the guy Reggie's birthday, but somebody had a visitor that came to the nursing home, and the visitor was um tested positive, and because that visitor visitor tested positive. They have quarantined everybody in the building. Nobody can visit anybody in the building. And so that means that even though it's his birthday, his wife can't even come see him on his birthday. And he is just like distraught. He's like, I'm. he's not well with it. He is so, because remember, he had had this whole conversation with Ralph Angel about how the meaning of life was his wife and being with his wife and loving his wife and just having his soulmate there. And now he's having his birthday and he can't even see her. 
or um, see her, feel her, touch her, or anything. Ralph Angel then said, listen, I got you. Even though you can't see your wife, I'm still going to throw you a birthday party, and it's still going to be good. You know, Ralph Angel is good people. Ralph Angel come from good stock, good, you know, home training. So he's going to do right by um, Mr. Reggie. Charlie's at home with Micah. This is after the whole fight. Um, maybe a day, maybe a few days later. She tells Micah, they're sitting there, and she has this conversation with Micah about the first time her and Davis had a fight, and how she felt like Davis wasn't um, helping her, wasn't doing what he needed to do as a dad, and that they broke up. And Micah says, well, how did you get, how did you all end up back together? Because this was like three months after Micah was born. And he says, she says, I apologize to him. Sincerely, just like I'm about to apologize to you now. She apologized to him, but I feel like she had to. I've talked to some people, um, and they said they didn't feel she had to apologize. And why would she apologize? I felt like she owed him an apology because she was like a lot of people. This episode was projecting. She was projecting what she experienced with Davis on Micah. Micah doesn't have a child. Micah is not married, engaged, or anything. Micah is a college student. College students have sex. College young men like to go play around, play the field, and have sex. College, Micah is having just as much problems grappling with cabin fever, the pandemic, the loneliness, the, you know, and all of those things as everybody else. And Micah is not cognitively as experienced with dealing with adult situations as you are, um, Charlie. So he may sometimes do things that may be um, immature. He may sometimes do things that you would not necessarily do. However, the comment about like father, like son, knowing how he feels about his dad in that situation, knowing all of the, you know, backstory, that was unfair. That was disrespectful. She owed it to Micah to apologize to him. Um, but I don't really see it as a big deal. Listen, talk to any young man, not any, but almost uh, a whole talk to most young men Micah's age. Almost every moment of the day, it was a conquest to get up in the next person. Or have the next person get up in them if that's your thing. But you, listen, have whole, whole will be filled. <laughs> okay, this is what you do. He's a college student. And so her, she really wanted him to be like her. But he's not. He's not. He's going to make mistakes. And that's a part of the college experience as well, That which is why I always encourage um, people going to college to get away from your parents. Because you have to make those mistakes so that you can learn from them and learn yourself and learn your own idiosyncrasies and things like that so that you can just mature as an adult. I don't know. But yeah, she had to apologize to him. I'm glad she did. Um, we then see Nova and White Boy Cop at home and they're having a conversation. And um they talk about how well things are going with Courtney and they're glad that you know this transition is working. And Nova says, Well, it's still early. And you know, let's let's hold off on just saying everything's uh, peachy keen, everything's just hunky dory. Because even if everything pans out with Courtney. We still, at some point, once the pandemic is over, have to go out there in the public and everybody's not going to embrace our union, who we are as a couple. And we have to be okay. We have to be ready to deal with that. She talked about how, I mean, you see all of the Trump 2020 MAGA um, stickers and bumper stickers and, you know, yard signs and stuff out there. We got to be ready because it's not going to be cool. It's not going to be okay. And so it was interesting. And I wonder where they're going to go with that, knowing where this country went when it came time for election cycle and right after the election leading up to the terrorist attack on January 6, 2021, I want to see where they're going to go with um, that part of it in the um, show. I know I'm real long now. I thought this was going to be a fast review and I'm real long at this point. Charlie and Mike are at home. Charlie is working on studying um, the by bylaws of St. Joe's because she wants to be ready for Parker and Landry when they come back. And you know, Micah immediately kicks into militant Mike loves um, all of this type of stuff. He's here. He's down for the cause. He's here for the fight. He loves this. He had that whole militant side of him. And so this notion of him partnering with his mom, especially now that she don't get made it right with him. He enjoys it. He's excited. He even gets a phone call and he ignores the phone call, sends him the voicemail, says, no, this is important to me. I want to do this. And they have this fun little rap interaction type thing um, where they're talking about, you know, forming this, you know, 
bond in this, not that they don't already have a bond, but this connection with regard to this aspect of who they are, this fight for St. Joe. Um, <clears throat> so I love seeing that. Now, at this point, everything from here on out, they was taking me out. Mr. Reggie is, it, Ralph Angel's at the um, nurse home. Mr. Reggie is there. Ralph Angel says, hey, Mr. Reggie, I got a surprise for you. Mr. Reggie said, listen, I ain't here for surprises. I'm already not in a good mood. I couldn't see my wife. Baby, Ralph Angel takes Mr. Reggie, after some talking to, over to the window. And he had made it where the wife could stand out of the window. And they could, you know, see each other, talk to each other through the window. Sit me on the glory. Baby, I was over here. Cry, listen, I could be a whole ass clown. And I had the tears of a clown last night. Listen, what I tell you? I was boohoo snot bubble crying with Mr. Reggie and um his wife took me all the way out. All the way out. I mean, took me out. I had to pause and say, oh, let me get it together. Then we had Hollywood. He went to his mom's house and he's reading this postcard that he had written to his mom when he was on the rig and talking about the prettiness and the beautifulness of the sun and the colors against the sea and how beautiful it was and how beautiful she was. Snot bubbles again. Y'all was really trying to get me out last night. I said, oh, dear God, here we go, here we go. Yeah. Took me all the way out. I was mm. Simultaneously, okay, you had Ralph Angel coming home after a long day of work, taking off the little clothes, being exhausted, and you could see he not only probably with Mr. Reggie, but probably with other um, of the elderly people at that nursing home, he is invested in them and how much of a toll it takes on you when you get invested in people like that. You have to carry that when you go home and you just have to just like, you, you, you're, you're exhausted. You're ex literally exhausted. You saw him. He was just so just spent and he had this conversation. He's like praying and talking to his dad. Um, and so forth. They have this conversation. He ain't take me out, but they almost got me. They almost got me because I was already feeling some kind of way already. So yeah, that moment he then goes in the um, house. The Darla is waiting there, and he just breaks down on Darla. And they have this beautiful conversation where he's crying and he was like, "Listen, we don't know how much time we got left. We never gonna have the perfect wedding. We don't know when it's gonna end. We don't need to wait to get married. We need to go ahead and get married now. Damn waiting." And I'm sure after seeing the interaction with Mr. Reggie and his wife breaking down like we always breaking down, he was like, nope, I, I can't have that happen. I can't lose you and not be able to call you my wife. And, he, and she was like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's do it tomorrow. And it kind of went off from there. And I was, you know, over here wiping my thug tears. Not thug tears, my clown tears. The tears of a clown when there's no one around. <laughs> Beautiful episode, phenomenal, more so than anything. I, you know, y'all know I pay attention to the writing. It was the writing for me because the writers are getting it right. Writers bring you in, they make you block out everything else, and they bring you into the the moment. Great writers make their words emote, and when the words emote, and you can have actors and actresses that can fully embrace all of that um, emotion and can portray that fully. You got great um, cinema. You got great cinema there. And this was great cinema, great television. Um, phenomenal job on this episode. I started off saying the episode with all that. And I, here I am like an hour into this review. Anyway, that's all I got for y'all. Let's get to the comment section, y'all. Let me know what y'all think. Until next time, thank y'all for coming. Y'all drive safely. I'm out.